100,000 subscribers. Guys, thanks for joining us tonight. This is going to be a little bit different than our normal video, even in so far as the channel update videos. Mm -hmm. We're going to probably talk for a little while here. It's a yeah. celebratory night for us. We've been so used to sitting underneath that canopy at 100 degrees slash 37 to 38 Celsius for our European viewers. And this. I will just say that when I suggested to Henry that we ought to film this outside over a beer or a cigar, he told me I was nuts because he didn't want to melt. So normally when we film those those uh, practical accuracy videos, especially if we're doing the long range ones, mm -hmm. in the summertime, we, we try not to film that in the summertime, but sometimes we end, when it, we end up having rare rifles that we can only hold on to for like, what, two weeks or something? Mm -hmm. We're sitting out there. 100 plus. With what, usually anywhere from four to eight rifles, normally closer to four if it's in the summertime. Yeah. The most I've done was eight or nine rifles in one day. Mm -hmm. You guys could see if certain rifles, the weather conditions the same, it was filmed on the same day. Yeah. So, anyways, because of that, <laughs> this... Yeah, this is brilliant. Yeah. This is great. So, first and foremost, we're going to give you guys a brief channel update, talk about some of the stuff we've got upcoming. Yes. Then we're going to get into some exciting new announcements we have with our company, Slate Black Industries. Mm -hmm. And if you guys stick around for that portion of the video, you will have a chance to get some free stuff. Then we're going to talk about some more exciting news, which is the release of the full scoreboard system that yes. we've got. And the launch but, of the Patreon account. Which the scoreboard system was hotly requested. Big time. We finally have gotten around to that. We'll, we'll touch on that a little sure. bit more as to why we, you know, why we haven't, up mm -hmm. to now, really focused on it. And then lastly, we've got uh, a little Q&A answering section, as well as some conversation on how we're going to be handling better communication with you guys in the future. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just kick things off with the channel update? Yeah. No, so I wanted to ask you specifically, because I kind of have been thinking this over as we've led up to this video. Yes. Think back in the last six months since our last big update, right? Right. I think it was at the beginning of the year. We've shot a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Pick one thing that stood out to you that was either the most surprising or the most fun or the video that you enjoyed making the most? Just one? Just one. Now, granted, we've had a video published basically every week, so I'm asking a lot, but I want you to narrow it down to just one. It's, it's got to be a practical accuracy video for me mm -hmm. because, to, quite frankly, it, it, a lot of times I get really surprised on PA stuff. And when it comes to that... It's got to be, this thing right here is a close second. Well, the people haven't even seen this thing yet. This thing, you mean? <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> the M39. Mm. The Finnish M39. Oh, my word. That thing, that thing took my breath away. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> when I saw what you did with it. And it's incredible. Uh, what, a $300 rifle that we're able to push out not only to 500, but one kilometer with iron sights. Yeah. With these metallic machines things from that correlate two points. 80 years ago. Incredible. Yeah. That, that, that one was. That was absolutely phenomenal. I couldn't believe when you hit the high. I was surprised when you hit 1K with the, the Mauser mm -hmm. uh, with an optic. Granted, a 4 by optic from the 30s or whatever yeah. it was, 39. But when you did it with the irons, that that one flew. That me. was perfect perfect conditions that day, though. Yeah, I mean, low was, winds and everything. With a slow-traveling projectile like that, in high winds, it's just... I mean, we tried to take it out to, again, but every time we took it out, it was like Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. So, uh, so when we took it out that first time, and that was the last... What, we did eight rifles that day? Nine you, rifles? You, you were working it. It was day. it was brutal. I yeah. mean, that was the same day I did the 98K, so my shoulder was... <laughs> so that, And that was the last rifle of the day. I remembered my wife was calling on, on the phone, yeah. and she was like, Love, are we still going to date night tonight? 
and you can still see on on the video like I'm like looking like the phone rings at one point it's on vibrate I don't know if, if you go back and look the, the phone's on vibrate I look at it and I'm like thinking like in inside I'm like ah, nine whole reviews my lovely wife oh let's do this Josh come on let's go well and the other thing is is you guys might not realize this but we end up we we drive it's a couple hours round trip to get out to our range to mm-hmm. shoot for you for the show. So, um, so the M thirty nine couldn't couldn't have picked yeah. a better one myself. Yeah, no, that yeah. one that one's excellent. I think for me, I've had a lot of fun shooting some of my more really like space. high performance space gun like yeah. stuff recently. Um, the stuff I shoot matches with, and that's always a blast, especially getting to show like the Dissident KL twelve, which is just this absolute monster. I think you it's call a it a bus. school bus. It's a school yeah, bus. the school bus, absolutely hilarious monster of a shotgun. So is that it for you? No, no. So I, I've had a lot of fun with that one, but I've shot that enough on my own that I know uh-huh. what to expect. The Chris Vector pistol, uh huh, yeah, absolutely yeah. floored me. Literally hadn't shot it. Went out to the range on the day we were filming, mm-hmm. zeroed it, and then ran the course, and darn near matched my match my match gun's yeah. time for for the course. I, I was that one blew me away so much so that I think we can probably share this now. We reached out to Chris USA, mm-hmm. and we asked them if they would come out and let us shoot some full auto variants of their of their vector yeah. and they were kind enough to oblige when we're on the call they were actually pretty surprised themselves at your performance mm-hmm. not that they were surprised at their own product but i think this goes back to sort of the premise of nine whole reviews i mean rarely do you have someone who is a, a uspsa grandmaster making you know big videos on on a regular basis like this yeah, i mean there really there really aren't too many GM yeah. USPSA shooters who even have YouTube channels, and then those you're so busy training. Well, those the day, guys right? who are yeah. competing at a high level, yeah. I mean, they they have even those who have them. Like, there's not very many long form videos and stuff out there. Mm-hmm. None, you know, so it's and on the on the other side, it's not that you know other YouTubers can't shoot. It's just it takes a long time to become a GM because of all the matches that you have to go to. So, I think for guys like Chris Vector. You know, the Chris, mm-hmm. they hadn't had a lot of guys with your type of trigger time mm. really test out a system like that. And then it's just so unconventional in the USPSA. Not on, yeah, sphere. not on YouTube anyway, yeah. right? So yeah. so anyway, that that happened. So, so we've we've got video of, of some full auto stuff coming down that is going to be up on the channel. And we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of stuff that's in between... to make ready this is a chinese ndm 86 we had a, a matt one of our viewers come uh and loan us this rifle unfired brand new in box we even wiped the inside there was nothing yep. absolutely nothing and he loaned it to us and let me deflower this <laughs> on the first shot there's, there's so much support on, on, on the channel. Yeah, and, and, and to think about the number of other firearms that we've shot that yeah. we've gotten access to thanks to one of you guys, or sometimes it's the same one of you guys sending yeah. us multiple stuff oh, yeah. or, or letting us letting us take your stuff. We just want to thank you guys so much yeah. for the support. A message on the board is just not enough, quite frankly. No. The amount of support that we've received from both the community and people. So uh, this all comes back to, again, us wanting to provide some semblance of value to you guys wherever possible because you're so good to us. And, and yeah. I, don't, I don't, I mean that wholeheartedly. And so I think that's a good way to transition our conversation into SBI, Slate Black Industries. If you're just seeing this now for the first time and you're new to the channel, we run uh, a firearms accessory company, again, Slate Black Industries. Um, as of right now, we're making m accessories. We're shooters. We go through the same pains that people out there go through. 
when you buy an M-Lock rail and you realize that you've got to pay, what, a hundred bucks? Start putting kit on it? To put stuff on it? Yeah. It, come on, it, it couldn't be that bad. So, I mean, we started, we started looking around, we started trying to put things together. So we're able to generate certain products that we find valuable ourselves and actually taking it out. We've taken, you know, stuff out to the field to slam on the course. Yeah. And now we are ready to announce second product from Slate Black Industries. Right here, let's give it some contrast. I predominantly did the design work on from mm -hmm. my time in doing, again, the competition and practical shooting. Right. It was really important for us, I think, to secure a number of features that you don't get in other hand stops out there, especially not all in one package. Mm -hmm. And for me, from a performance perspective, I really wanted it to provide the best possible angles for me to control recoil and pull mm -hmm. rearward, put rearward pressure on the gun, while also then offering me a nice and simple way to use it as a barricade brace. The rest or barricade I'm trying to take has an angle that actually comes toward me. So instead of being flat where I'm into the barricade like this, I'm actually having to bevel and turn. And normally, if I didn't have anything here on the bottom of the gun, well, I would just slip off the side of the barricade. In this instance, what this also prevents me from doing is C-clamping the gun how I would normally want to do it. So if I was C-clamping up here, I don't really get very much leverage on the gun with my thumb. And so as I apply pressure with my shoulder, it's very hard to keep the gun steady in this particular position. If, however, I use the slate stop, I'm actually able to hook around the back of the slate stop, apply pressure into the barricade, hook my thumb around the slate stop, apply counter pressure with my shoulder, other fingers wrap over and around the top of the rail, and I really dug in and bit in hard into this particular barricade, giving me the most stable position that I'm going to get from shooting from this particular platform. But then as we begin to get deeper into kind of the design work on it, one of the things that you noticed right away that we should be including in this is a means of easy kind of patrol carry or everyday carry well, if you're walking around it holding goes, the rifle. It goes back to the, our backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You're the competition shooter, so your I'm mindset performance. is focused on that 10 to 20 seconds of drilling your rifle at the target. I was a soldier. I had to carry this damn thing in and out of vehicles all day. Here, if you have a grip that's too fat, it just kind of like digs into everything. Mm -hmm. If you have a grip that's too small, you can't actually use it per se. But then a lot of times when you're on patrol, you're not patrolling on C-clamp all the time. No way. You hold it like a normal rifle. So having, having certain cuts at the very Angles end to, and features, mm -hmm, yeah. to include a patrol carry, a comfort carry, and then being able to quickly transition into a barricade stop or then transition into a recoil control stance. Absolutely. I mean, that's the type of stuff that we're looking at with two guys from very, very different backgrounds, you know. Yeah, yeah and, and that's that that's exactly it. At the time that we're releasing this video, the product is likely live on the website, potentially live on the website. We'll see. We'll put some overlays in the video to tell you whether or not it's live, but live or not, Henry, right. there are going to be 15 people watching this video who are going to get slate stops sent to them for free. Shipped on our dime. Shipped on our dime. So Josh, how would a discerning gentleman or gentlewoman 
be able to obtain said exquisite grips. All right, so if you want to get a chance to win at the giveaway for up to 15 of the slate stops that we're giving away, mm -hmm. we're going to give five away on three different platforms. Five of them on Facebook, five of them on YouTube, and five of them to our patrons. And we'll get to Patreon in just a second. So, if you are on Facebook, just hit the share button, throw down hashtag Slate Black Industries. And what we're going to do is, after a couple weeks' time, we are going to do a random selection of those mm -hmm. of you guys who have entered one of those hashtags. Again, five from Facebook will be picked randomly, or YouTube. In the comment section of the video, just throw down hashtag Sleep Black Industry, and that will implicitly right there enter you. So on the patrons, it'll just be a random, a random selection of all patrons who mm -hmm. are who are currently active. Which Patreon, being obviously having a, a smaller number, it, has yeah, yeah, a pa massive right. chance of right. winning. Right. So this is a good way, I think, for us to kind of talk about the patreon page we have been asked whether or not we were going to do a patreon page for i don't know probably since we had like thirty thousand subs yeah like a year I, ago I think before that to be to it, be fair realistically i think you said it best when you and i were talking like it floored you because you're like yeah. people are asking to donate to us and like we're, we didn't even have a full yeah. documented but show schedule is, and... i didn't want to back then. i didn't want to yet back then not not that i not that i didn't like money i mean obviously money helps the show go and and we've obviously both dumped an astronomically mm -hmm. amount of money into into yep. the show yep. itself yep. but i i fundamentally disagree with asking people to support you with with their hard-earned money when when you don't have any value push forward right there's Same. no way to return the value to exactly them. which is why you know even even when we launched slate black i was i was you know somewhat okay with it because we're actually putting value forward but now i think as the show's matured we see more of what we're trying to do we see more of the product and the effect of the product i'm actually yeah i see it i mean we actually need the funding to to continue this pace because mm -hmm. right now we've been running we've been running ourselves dry and I think this is a good point to sort of transition towards a long-term solution on how we can continue to push this type of material out. Yeah, the show on a reoccurring, yeah. constant reoccurring schedule over and over and over and over and always be, be out sourcing the next, mm -hmm. the next thing to put on the show. So, I completely agree with everything you said. I know when we've debated whether or not we should launch a Patreon page, everything came back to a value proposition for you guys. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we could put forward something that was going to be valuable enough that we felt m morally correct in taking yeah. the money. You know, so the first thing was the kickoff of an official scoreboard. Yes. Now, this is something that Henry poured a lot of time and effort into. Yes. I, I, I can't take credit for any of that. You had to decide, like, what information was relevant to put in there. And, mm -hmm. and there's all these different categories that you wanted to carry through. All the way down to which shooter was shooting the guns, mm -hmm. you know, and then going back and going through all of the old videos and pulling out all the scores and all the information that was relevant mm -hmm. and 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 so on and so forth. Now, I mentioned that that's on Patreon, but it's a free you, function. You don't actually have to pay for it. <laughs> it. It's a free function on Patreon. Really, you go on the Patreon page, scroll down, you'll see a segment towards the practical accuracy scoreboard, and from there you just. Click on, click that link, and you'll be able to view the scoreboard free of charge. Right. So all that said, we're we are going to have a Q and A section on the Patreon where you guys who are, are writing in, who are again kind of stepping up the support for the channel beyond that of just a, a regular viewer or subscriber to the show, we are going to prioritize all of those questions. Wait till that's gone. Going to prioritize. Sorry yeah. that we were we were about to get dive bombed. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're definitely going to do our best to prioritize all of those questions on Patreon. Our game plan is to either answer them directly or put together uh, response videos every mm -hmm. once in a while where we sum up the questions and and come to you guys in a very similar format to this, I'd say, and yes. probably come back with some answers. So as as we wrap up this video. 
we wanted to answer one question each. It's the same question, but it's probably one that we see more frequently than anything else right now. Yeah. And that is a little bit of information about us. Who you are. What did you do? Right, who we are, what our experience is. So, Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'll start off. I'm going to keep this firearm-centric. I grew up in Massachusetts, and I grew up with a family that wasn't necessarily anti-gun by any sense of the imagination, but who didn't own guns. Obviously, in Massachusetts, for our viewers who aren't aware of this, maybe international viewers, the laws are not very conducive to firearms ownership. You have to jump through a bunch of hoops, you have to go through registrations, so on and so forth. So I did not grow up shooting. Um, My grandfather was, I think, the only one in the family who actually owned a firearm, a Walther PPK in 380. Classic. A beautiful to look at firearm, horrible to shoot, (laughs) but We'll be publishing a video on that actual gun in yes. the not-so-distant future. You actually see it in the P7 video. That's true. Yeah. Um, and so I got my first exposure was through my grandfather shooting air rifles up at, up at the farm, um, but never actual firearms. And again, he had the Walther, but it was never something that I actually shot with him. Again, because the the laws were a little bit, and it was right. it, it wasn't the same culture as you get somewhere like say in the southern United States. It's just not the same. So I moved down to Texas to go to school, where I ran into this guy, and he exposed me to basically all of this. And well, three gun to that, to begin that with was, was it. The starting. That was it. And our uh, let's wait for this dive bomber to leave. Good. We are not here marked for the Luftwaffe. Yeah, (laughs) the siren. No no siren as it dives down on us. Uh, So, yeah, so I met Henry when I came down to school um, for college in Texas. And within a couple weeks of meeting him, uh, I think at that time I had, I had, I had owned, I owned one gun, I think. I think I owned a Mini 14. That's it. Not the one that you saw me shoot on the channel, but a very oh. similar one. I think I had some Tapco gear on. You had it. a Tapco stock with an EOTech. That's right. Forward the, yeah, scout like rail. Like a scout rail, yeah. Yeah. Man, that was a. Uh... And how did you do on that three gun match? Yeah, so, so Henry took me to my first shooting match. Um, I think I was like. You didn't do poorly. Well, I mean, I think I was, like, second or third from the bottom. Are you serious? Yeah, it was almost last. Oh, never mind. I take my word back. Yeah, you shot really well, and I remember being like, ah, crap. This guy's really good. I should pay attention. Uh, this is a long time. I mean, uh, this, this is, is a long... This is, this is a decade even, ago. This is a decade I don't even three-gun anymore. That's No, this is a decade ago. Yeah. So, anyway, we, we shot this match, and I, by my nature, am a very competitive person. Uh, I played sports all through all through high school and I was looking for an outlet to play something in college um, mm-hmm. and I opted instead of to continue on with the sports that I had been playing I opted to dive into competitive shooting I found a few mentors in the competitive shooting sports um, two guys specifically I'll name drop first names here mm-hmm. they probably don't don't even watch the show but Jamie and Doug were two guys who kind of were the best, quote-unquote, the best shooters in the local clubs that kind of took me under their wing and taught me about what it, what you had to do to be good at competitive shooting. And it, it went from there. I took a couple years off in the middle after I had a pretty serious accident, mm-hmm. um, and I, I lost the ability to walk for a, a period of time. You um, got a gold dot stuck in your leg. That's accurate. I yeah. didn't put it there. Oh. Somebody put it there by accident, but we'll, we'll we'll save that for another we'll save that for another session of yeah. of beers and cigars. But uh, yeah, so I took a few years off. I, when I took the time off, I was a decent enough shooter. I was probably like an A class shooter. Mm-hmm. And then in the last couple of years, when we started getting you, you came back from deployments uh, and from being overseas and. We started shooting together again, and I really dove back hard into competitive shooting and put in the time that's required to Mm. 
Because basically, I mean, being realistic all right, here. All right, all right, all right. Well, here, here's one of the things. Josh is very good with long arms. He's he's not going to admit. What was it? The, did you take the Texas title in 2017? Yeah. So the Texas Open Championship. Yeah. The Cowtown Classic, which is another big Texas match. Uh-huh. The Oilfield Classic, which is another big Texas. Match. Those were all champions. Like you, you were they're, top they're, of the list. They're big. They're big matches. No, no, no. Like were you top of yeah, the list? Yeah, I won each of okay. those. Yeah. Okay. So after he did all this, and correct me if I am wrong, he went. And signed up for a Mississippi... Was it the state champion? The Mississippi state championship. Yeah. Went to sign up for the Mississippi state champion match. And a lot of times at these state champion matches, guys talk. They, they shoot together. They know who each other mm-hmm. are. Yeah. And so <laughs> this guy flies in or flies in. I a, drove. That's why guy, I signed up for it. Because it was like from Houston to Mississippi is like a six, seven hour drive. So I was all like, right. I'll drive. So I'll this go guy drive over. signs up for the Mississippi, Mississippi state championship. Yeah, just to screw around to see what's going on, see what's up, who's over there. That evening, he drives away with a cup. <laughs> with the Mississippi State Cup, bringing it back to Texas. <laughs> it's true. Did, I did, did drive home that night. Do people realize who you were afterwards, or did they just, like... I don't know. We just lost the cup to a Texan? Well, technically in USPSA, like, even though I won the match, they give it to the first place person who was from mississippi uh, I but i got to take the first place plaque home okay 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 <laughs> so so henry <laughs> henry talks talks me up but i i even when i started shooting back in when henry first kind of was introducing me to the sport i always yeah. excelled shooting ars yeah. uh and uh, I think it's because it's probably easier, but then, for me at least, but like implicitly I just think it's easier, but as time went on I realized that like I'm putting real space between me and other other mm-hmm. shooters who I was shooting with in that particular area. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. There, there are so many phenomenal shooters out there, though, when it comes down to USPSA, that if you take any time off, like I haven't shot in a year or so, mm-hmm. And I went back and shot the Texas PCC championship, uh, the team championship, and ended up in third place after having not shot for basically a year. But it, so the guys there are, you know, all of these guys are phenomenal shooters. So it's. You realize anytime, the absurdity of that. You took a year off and you still left with a third. Yeah, no, I get it. But like at any, at any given point in time, like there are so many shooters who are putting in a lot of time and effort that if you slack just a little bit, you kind of. Like right, you 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 lose the edge, and that is really what I try to get across. I think that informs my position when I make statements and I perform runs in any of our videos mm-hmm. or any of our content. It's always about how fundamentals and training are so critically important for performance. If you actually care about performance, sure, not everybody does. So that that's me. I'm 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 a competitive person by nature, and I latched on to competitive shooting because it's a heck of a lot of mm. fun. So, I made mention of, obviously, your time in the service, but I didn't go into specifics. Henry, why don't you take us through kind of uh, you, your journey? Josh led in, he was from Massachusetts, and, and he didn't grow up around firearms, and neither did I. I. I grew up in Hong Kong. I was born in the States, so I grew up in Hong Kong. Can you believe this guy, Hong Kong? No. <laughs> so, anyways, in Hong Kong, firearms are quite difficult to obtain. You can get a license for it. It's It's expensive. It's, um, it also takes a lot of time. I never had a firearms license. I was never of age to have a firearms license. My, my family didn't grow up having firearms around, per se. Um, so when I came back stateside, um, that was my journey into actually owning the first firearms. Because I'd always been interested in how firearms work. Because a big part of me, I'm interested in history. Right. And the role that firearms play in history. I guess rewind back, the first firearm I've ever shot was a Type 56 Chinese Kalashnikov variant. Like a full yeah, no, no, it's a military, military Yeah, it was a military one. Because yeah. yeah, you see like all these Chinese people in Chinese tour groups. We were in one of those tour groups and the tour guide took us to like a, like sort of a, the back entrance to a military training facility. And they had like all this whole pay scale, uh, for you could pay certain amounts of money for one cartridge, and you know it was a shooting range that that like that one looked... like one round. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so they they had the shooting range set up, and um, I I purchased 
a full magazine for a Type 56, a Kalashnikov. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... First time you ever shot. First time I've ever shot. And I was familiar with how firearms worked. I was familiar with where the selector settings were on, on for firearms because I used to read about these things in the in the local library. And um, as the range officer slash soldier, I don't know if he was a sergeant or a range officer, as he looked away, I popped the selector into the middle position <laughs> and I slammed the whole magazine down range. Couldn't control it worth a damn. <laughs> There's this massive grin on my face afterwards, and he told me that I, I, w I was never to come back. I mean, boo-hoo, right? <laughs> but, so that was the first, the first firearm I've ever shot was a Type 56 AK on fully automatic from the hands of a not-so-happy, potentially PLA sergeant. <laughs> um, years later, when I came back to Texas, uh, I realized that I have a right to purchase firearms, in fact. Mm -hmm. And there are, in fact, matches where people go and learn how to shoot and, and shoot better. So I initially, my exposure was with uh, um, NRA service rifle matches, which is why when you're looking at the Practical Accuracy series, I'm shooting a lot of iron sights, and a lot of these guys are, are showing us, were showing me, guys like me, who've never shot before, how to properly use a service rifle with... Well, and, and let's be honest here. This is coming from coming from somebody who's seen a lot of people shoot, a lot of yeah. high-caliber people shoot. Henry shoots iron sights <laughs> darn near as well as anybody that I've ever met. I mean, you you have an innate ability to do that, which is pretty impressive. Like, I feel like with an optic, I, I'm, I'm a pretty darn good shooter when it comes to even shooting on the range, but with iron, I, can, I can't reach more than, like, 300 yards at most. Like, beyond that, I can't even see it. And you're out there sh hitting one-kilometer shots. Well, it's, it's what I like. I mean, it's what I like. It's what I do a lot. It's what I did a lot. Um, and then, I think after, after that, for a while, I... This was back when AR-15s were not very popular. I mean, I think my stock yeah, M4 it's like was... The, the early 2000 era, right? Yeah, like... yeah. My stock M4 was a pretty cool deal back then. Yeah. And so we would take this... We would take things like that and, and my SPO-1. The shadow. Uh, the, no, the, 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 the non-shadow. Non -shadow. Yeah. That is where I developed my love for CZs, yes. by the way. I sold it to Josh, by the way. Yeah. Um, and I started shooting with I started shooting three gun because I I thought it was I mean like any young person would would look at three gun and think it, and it, to be honest it is a, it is a cool sport I'm just not into it anymore mm -hmm. especially with the shotgun stuff mm -hmm. I'm I'm just it's just not my thing um, and so that's that's where I ended up you know meeting with Josh uh, years later uh, work after working around the world for a while I joined the uh, military. Uh, join the army. Um, initially, looking to join as as an intel officer because of my uh, linguistics and 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 multicultural background growing up and, yeah. and all that. But um, since the military thought I was a spy. Uh, Ended up, uh, I ended up telling them, hey, you know what? I'm all right. You know, save yourself some trouble, save yourself some paperwork. I'll save myself some time. There's this branch called the Ordnance Corps. I sort of like guns. I sort of like making my own ammunition. I sort of like off-road vehicles, and they deal with all of that stuff. So why don't you just put me into that? And that was it. I, I joined the military as an ordnance officer at the very beginning. It was interesting going through ordnance school. It was interesting actually seeing a lot of the implementation and, and watching the process of, of firearms, how they went from a concept in the civilian world into an actual thing. In the Ordnance Corps, back historically, I had to myself a whole library of, of information open to me, and I was able to learn about how certain weapon systems and, and how certain, certain weapons programs were run. And on top of that, the implementation of it, you know, how it ended up going into soldiers' hands and the feedback and how that turned into a feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. It was all 
quite frankly, a horrible experience of my <laughs> dreams and this beautiful idea of the soldier getting the best thing snapped into a very, very quick reality. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. I mean, the Ordnance Corps has done a lot. I mean, it's, it's also run by humans, and as humans, we, we make our own errors. Um, the Ordnance Corps has implemented a lot of interesting things, and it is, a part, it is interesting being a part of that legacy. I was a journalist before I joined the Army, which is why I was working overseas. I worked in Paris. I worked in northern China. I worked all around the U.S. The, the Army paid for my master's uh, to, to study journalism. I ended up becoming a uh, press officer. Working with press, working with a non-traditional type of unit, I was able to open my eyes to a whole litany of things. I mean, I could be with EOD one week, um, getting shelled at Fob Shank, and then the next week I could be up at Bagram, and then the next week I could be um, snowed in on the mountaintops in Fob Sharana in a Russian, on a Russian base. Yeah. Well, and that's really interesting, right, because one of the things I know you've talked to me about is the extent that you've had the ability to work not only within the U.S. armed services. Yes, because I was in, in stationed in Europe, too. I, I, I would say I, I primarily had my stuff in a house in Germany, and I worked <laughs> around Europe. And most of the, a lot of that was on the Central Europe to Eastern Europe side. Right. So I ended up working with a whole lot of different nations. So, I mean, say like the Austrians. I've worked with them. I've worked with the Baltic states, the Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, going down to Poland. I spent a lot of time in Poland. Spent a lot of time in the Czech Republic, um, the Greeks, Italians, Maltese, um, the French, mm -hmm. obviously the Bundeswehr. Yep. So, so exposure to a lot of different militaries, a lot of different weapon systems. My background as both a an ordnance officer and then a press officer having the experience with publications then also working with other nations and seeing how these things were used. Yeah. Uh, it gives me an advantage over some of the other guys who are making independent publications in the mm -hmm. YouTube sphere. Yeah. So that's why when you look at my videos, you see a lot of history, you see a lot of you know this stuff where I talk about this nation having these issues or adopting things for this advantage. It's because that's, that's my passion. That's, that's what I like. Right. So especially contrary to when you look at the components that I contribute, which mm -hmm. is almost all about performance. Which is interesting because with some of the, the special operations units, they look at comp competitors and competition shooters, what they're doing. They adopt a lot of what the competition shooters are doing. From a performance perspective. Yes, yeah. because the competition shooters are working out kinks, and then the SF are actively trying to take them into the field. And then at that point, mm -hmm. the regular army starts looking at what SF is doing and pulling it in. The red dots on pistols was a big thing. That's probably uh, one of the best examples because competitors have been doing that since, like, I think it's the, yeah, man, I think it's the early '90s or the late '80s before before I was even, yeah. you know, conceived. Yeah. So, so the funny <laughs> thing is, I mean, these guys, competitors, have been using red dots on pistols since then, and the whole firearms community kind of like points at them and laughs at them, like like they're the school nerds, and then all of a sudden the SF guys start running around with red dots. On the back of their uh, Glocks. Yeah, and now suddenly it's the cool thing to do is to have your armored Glock. Yeah. It's just, it is interesting to see how, in, in the civilian sector, I mean. Well, I mean, so. look, at there's lots of police officers who, who use it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more of a trend to have that micro red dot on the back of your pistol. Yeah. To, to a sense that that is a standard thing. So, I think with that said, when, when you understand what our backgrounds are, it kind of, it feeds into really what we're both bringing to the channel and what we think allow us to provide you guys a unique piece of content where you're getting a wide view of any of the given firearms that we're putting on the channel, mm -hmm. whether it be from the historic and the very technical aspects all the way over to you know, the more performance-based aspects. But I know we've been going for a while here. We could probably keep going for a lot longer. Maybe we... Uh, should get another round and uh, and keep going, but uh, for right now, 100k, only the beginning as far as I'm concerned. As long as, as you said time and time again to me, as long as, as, long we, as the, the internet allow, allow us to do it, the the, the lords of the intersphere, yeah, the interhighways. Yeah, we'll we'll keep at it. Yes, so guys. Until next time. 
I'm out. See you on the range. Oh, good session, man. Dude, we're we supposed to talk about this. Ah, oh, crap. I'm not starting. I'm not starting over, man. F it. <laughs> Echo 96, this is Zero 96, 4 Vic, 8 packs, Redcon 1, Green to Green, top copy, over. Echo 96, this is Echo 96, Roger, over. 1 Vic, Zero 91, 1 pack, Green to Green, over. Echo 96, Roger, over. 1 Vic, 1 Vic, 2 packs, Redcon 1, over.